Chapter Thirty One of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital: A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Friedrich Engels. Part Eight. The so-called primitive accumulation, Chapter Thirty One, Genesis of the Industrial Capitalist. The genesis of the industrial capitalist did not proceed in such a gradual way as that of the farmer. Doubtless, many small guild masters and yet more independent small artisans or even wage laborers transformed themselves into small capitalists, and by gradually extending exploitation of wage labor and corresponding accumulation into full-blown capitalists. In the infancy of capitalist production, things often happened, as in the infancy of medieval towns, where the question, which of the escaped serfs should be master and which servant, was in great part decided by the earlier or later date of their flight. The snail's pace of this method corresponded in no wise with the commercial requirements of the new world market that the great discoveries of the end of the fifteenth century created. But the Middle Ages had handed down two distinct forms of capital, which mature in the most different economic social formations, and which, before the end of the capitalist mode of production, are all considered as capital quand même, all the same, usurpers' capital and merchants' capital. Footnote: Industrial here in contradistinction to agricultural. In the categoric sense, the farmer is an industrial capitalist as much as the manufacturer. End note. Quote, At present, all the wealth of society goes first into possession of the capitalist. He pays the landowner his rent, the laborer his wages, the tax and tithe gatherer their claims, and keeps a large, indeed the largest, and a continually augmenting share of the annual produce of labor for himself. The capitalist may now be said to be the first owner of all the wealth of the community, though no law has conferred on him the right to this property. This change has been effected by the taking of interest on capital, and it is not a little curious that all the lawgivers of Europe endeavored to prevent this by statutes, viz., statutes against usury. The power of the capitalist all over the wealth of the country is a complete change in the right of property, and by what law or series of laws was it effected? End quote. Footnote: The natural and artificial rights of property contrasted. London, 1832, pages 98 through 99. Author of the anonymous work, Theodore Hodgkin. End note. The author should have remembered that revolutions are not made by laws. The money capital formed by means of usury and commerce was prevented from turning into industrial capital in the country by the feudal constitution, in the towns by the guild organization. These fetters vanished with the dissolution of feudal society with the expropriation and partial eviction of the country population. The new manufactures were established at weapons, or at inland points beyond the control of the old municipalities and their guilds. Hence, in England, an embittered struggle of the corporate towns against these new industrial nurseries. Footnote. Even as late as 1794, the small cloth-makers of Leeds sent a deputation to Parliament with a petition for a law to forbid any merchant from becoming a manufacturer. Dr. Aiken, first C, and note. The discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, signalized the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. These idyllic proceedings are the chief momenta of primitive accumulation. On their heels treads the commercial war of the European nations, with the globe for a theater. It begins with the revolt of the Netherlands from Spain, assumes giant dimensions in England's anti-Jacobin war, and is still going on in the opium wars against China. The different momenta of primitive accumulation distribute themselves now more or less in chronological order, particularly over Spain, Portugal, Holland, France, and England. In England, at the end of the seventeenth century, they arrive at a systematical combination, embracing the colonies, the national debt, the modern mode of taxation, and the protectionist system. These methods depend in part on brute force, 
for example, the colonial system. But they all employ the power of the state, the concentrated and organized force of society, to hasten, hothouse fashion, the process of transformation of the feudal mode of production into the capitalist mode, and to shorten the transition. Force is the midwife of every old society pregnant with a new one. It is in itself an economic power. Of the Christian colonial system, W. Howitt, a man who makes a speciality of Christianity, says, The barbarians and desperate outrages of the so-called Christian race, throughout every region of the world, and not upon people they have been able to subdue, are not to be paralleled by those of any other race, however fierce, however untaught, and however reckless of mercy and of shame, in any age of the earth. Footnote. William Howitt, Colonization and Christianity a popular history of the treatment of the natives by the Europeans in all their colonies. London, 1838, page 9. On the treatment of the slaves there is a good compilation in Charles Comte, Traité de la Législation, Troisième Edition, Bruxelles, 1837. This subject one must study in detail, to see what the bourgeoisie makes of itself and of the laborer, wherever it can, without restraint, model the world after its own image. End note. The history of the colonial administration of Holland, and Holland was the head capitalistic nation of the seventeenth century, is one of the most extraordinary relations of treachery, bribery, massacre, and meanness. Footnote. Thomas Stamford Raffles, late lieutenant governor of that island. The History of Java, London, 1817. End note. Nothing is more characteristic than their system of stealing men to get slaves for Java. The men-stealers were trained for this purpose. The thief, the interpreter, and the seller were the chief agents in this trade, native princes the chief sellers. The young people stolen were thrown into the secret dungeons of the celebs, until they were ready for sending to the slave ships. An official report says, This one town of Makassar, for example, is full of secret prisons, one more horrible than the other, crammed with unfortunates, victims of greed and tyranny fettered in chains, forcibly torn from their families. To secure Malacca, the Dutch corrupted the Portuguese governor. He let them into the town in 1641. They hurried at once to his house and assassinated him, to abstain from the payment of 21,875 pounds, the price of his treason. Wherever they set foot, devastation and depopulation followed. Banjuwangi, a province of Java, in 1750, numbered over 80,000 inhabitants. In 1811, only 18,000. Sweet Commerce. The English East India Company, as is well known, obtained, besides the political rule in India, the exclusive monopoly of the tea trade, as well as of the Chinese trade in general, and of the transport of goods to and from Europe. But the coasting trade of India and between the islands, as well as the internal trade of India, were the monopoly of the higher employees of the country. The monopolies of salt, opium, betel, and other commodities were inexhaustible mines of wealth. The employees themselves fixed the price and plundered at will the unhappy Hindus. The governor-general took part in this private traffic. His favorites received contracts under conditions whereby they, cleverer than the alchemists, made gold out of nothing. Great fortunes sprang up like mushrooms in a day. Primitive accumulation went on with the advance of a shilling. The trial of Warren Hastings swarms with such cases. Here is an instance. A contract for opium was given to a certain Sullivan at the moment of his departure on an official mission to a part of India far removed from the opium district. Sullivan sold his contract to one Bin for forty thousand pounds. Bin sold it the same day for sixty thousand pounds. And the ultimate purchaser who carried out the contract declared that after all he realized an enormous gain. According to one of the lists laid before Parliament, the company and its employees from 1757 to 1766 got six million pounds from the Indians as gifts. Between 1769 and 1770, the English manufactured a famine by buying up all the rice and refusing to sell it again, except at fabulous prices. Footnote. In the year 1866, more than a million Hindus died of hunger in the province of Orissa alone. Nevertheless, the attempt was made to enrich the Indian treasury by the price at which the necessaries of life were sold to the starving people. End note. 
The treatment of the aborigines was, naturally, most frightful in plantation colonies destined for export trade only, such as the West Indies, and in rich and well-populated countries, such as Mexico and India, that were given over to plunder. But even in the colonies properly so called, the Christian character of primitive accumulation did not belie itself. Those sober virtuosi of Protestantism, the Puritans of New England in 1703, by decrees of their assembly, set a premium of forty pounds on every Indian scalp, and every captured redskin. In 1720, a premium of one hundred pounds on every scalp. In 1744, after Massachusetts Bay had proclaimed a certain tribe as rebels, the following prices. For a male scalp of twelve years and upwards, one hundred pounds, new currency, for a male prisoner, one hundred and five pounds, for women and children prisoners, fifty pounds, for scalps of women and children, fifty pounds. The colonial system took its revenge on the descendants of the pious pilgrim fathers, who had grown seditious in the meantime. At English instigation and for English pay they were tomahawked by redskins. The British Parliament proclaimed bloodhounds and scalping as means that God and nature has given into its hand. The colonial system ripened like a hothouse trade and navigation. The society's monopolia of Luther were powerful levers for concentration of capital. The colony secured a market for the budding manufacturers, and through monopoly of the market and increased accumulation. The treasurers captured outside Europe by undisguised looting, enslavement, and murder floated back to the mother country and were turned into capital. Holland, which first fully developed the colonial system in 1648, stood already in the acme of its commercial greatness. It was in almost exclusive possession of the East Indian trade and the commerce between the southeast and northwest of Europe. Its fisheries, marine, manufactures surpassed those of any other country. The total capital of the Republic was probably more than all of the rest of Europe put together. Gulick forgets to add that by 1648 the people of Holland were more overworked, poorer, and more brutally oppressed than those of all the rest of Europe put together. Today industrial supremacy implies commercial supremacy. In the period of manufacture properly so called, it is, on the other hand, the commercial supremacy that gives industrial predominance. Hence the preponderant role that the colonial system plays at that time. It was the strange god who perched himself on the altar by jowl with the old gods of Europe, and one fine day with a shove and a kick chucked them all of a heap. It proclaimed surplus value, making as the sole end and aim of humanity. The system of public credit, i.e. of national debt, whose origin we discover in Genoa and Venice as early as the Middle Ages, took possession of Europe generally during the manufacturing period. The colonial system, with its maritime trade and commercial wars, served as a forcing-house for it. Thus it first took root in Holland. National debts, i.e., the alienation of the state, whether despotic, constitutional, or republican, marked with its stamp the capitalistic era. The only part of the so-called national wealth that actually enters into the collective possessions of modern peoples is their national debt. Hence, as a necessary consequence, the modern doctrine that a nation becomes the richer, the more deeply indebted is. Public credit becomes the credo of capital. And with the rise of national debt-making, want of faith in the national debt takes the place of the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which may not be forgiven. Footnote. William Cobbett remarks that in England all public institutions are designated royal. As compensation for this, however, there is the national debt. End note. The public debt becomes one of the most powerful levers of primitive accumulation. As with the stroke of an enchanter's wand, it endows barren money with the power of breeding, and thus turns it into capital, without the necessity of its exposing itself to the troubles and risks inseparable from its employment in industry or even in usury. The state creditors actually give nothing away, for the sum lent is transformed into public bonds, easily negotiable, which go on functioning in their hands just as so much hard cash would. But further, apart from the class of lazy annuitants thus created, and from the improvised wealth of the financiers, middlemen between the government and the nation, as also apart from the taxpayers, merchants, private manufacturers, to whom a good part of every national loan renders the service of a capital, fallen from heaven, the national debt has given rise to joint stock companies, 
to dealings in negotiable effects of all kinds, and to agiotage, in a word, to stock exchange gambling, and the modern bankocracy. At their birth the great banks, decorated with national titles, were only associations of private spectators, who placed themselves by the side of governments, and, thanks to the privileges they received, were in a position to advance money to the state. Hence the accumulation of the national debt has no more infallible measure than the successive rise in the stock of these banks, whose full development dates from the founding of the Bank of England in 1694. The Bank of England began with lending its money to the government at eight per cent. At the same time it was empowered by Parliament to coin money out of the same capital, by lending it again to the public in the form of bank-notes. It was allowed to use these notes for discounting bills, making advances on commodities, and for buying the precious metals. It was not long ere this credit money, made by the bank itself, became the coin in which the Bank of England made its loans to the State, and paid, on account of the State, the interest on the public debt. It was not enough that the bank gave with one hand and took back more with the other. It remained, even whilst receiving, the eternal creditor of the nation down to the last shilling advanced. Gradually it became inevitably the receptacle of the metallic hoard of the country, and the centre of gravity of all commercial credit. What effect was produced on their contemporaries by the sudden uprising of this brood of bankocrats, financiers, rentiers, brokers, stock-jobbers, etc., is proved by the writings of that time, e.g. by Bolingbrokes. Footnote. If the Tartars were to flood into Europe today, it would be a difficult job to make them understand what a financier is with us. Montesquieu, Esprit des Lois, Page 33, Edition, London, 1769. End With the national debt arose an international credit system, which often conceals one of the sources of primitive accumulation in this or that people. Thus the villainies of the Venetian thieving system formed one of the secret bases of the capital wealth of Holland, to whom Venice, in her decadence, lent large sums of money. So also was it with Holland and England. By the beginning of the eighteenth century the Dutch manufacturers were far outstripped. Holland had ceased to be the nation preponderant in commerce and industry. One of its main lines of business, therefore, from 1701 to 1776, is the lending out of enormous amounts of capital, especially to its great rival, England. The same thing is going on today between England and the United States. A great deal of capital, which appears today in the United States without any certificate of birth, was yesterday in England the capitalized blood of children. As the national debt finds its support in the public revenue, which must cover the yearly payments for interest, the modern system of taxation was the necessary complement of the system of national loans. The loans enable the government to meet extraordinary expenses, without the taxpayers feeling it immediately, but they necessitate, as a consequence, increased taxes. On the other hand, the raising of taxation caused by the accumulation of debts contracted one after another compels the government always to have recourse to new loans for extraordinary expenses. Modern fiscality, whose pivot is formed by taxes on the most necessary means of subsistence, thereby increasing their price, thus contains within itself the germ of automatic progression. Overtaxation is not an accident, but rather a principle. In Holland, therefore, where this system was first inaugurated, the great patriot, de Witt, has in his maxims extolled it as the best system for making the wage-laborer submissive, frugal, industrious, and overburdened with labor. The destructive influence that it exercises on the condition of the wage-laborer concerns us less, however, here, than the forcible expropriation, resulting from it, of peasants, and, in a word, all elements of the lower middle class. On this there are not two opinions, even among the bourgeois economists. Its expropriating efficacy is still further heightened by the system of protection, which forms one of its integral parts. The great part that the public debt, and the fiscal system corresponding with it, has played in the capitalization of wealth, and the expropriation of the masses, has led many writers, like Cobbett, Doubleday, and others, to seek in this, incorrectly, the fundamental cause of the misery of the modern peoples. The system of protection was an artificial means of manufacturing manufactures, of expropriating independent laborers, of capitalizing the national means of production and subsistence, of forcibly abbreviating the transition from the medieval to the modern mode of production. 
the European states tore one another to pieces about the patent of this invention, and once entered into the service of the surplus value makers, did not merely lay under the contribution, in the pursuit of this purpose, their own people, indirectly, through protective duties, directly through export premiums. They also forcibly rooted out, in their dependent countries, all industry, as, for example, England did with the Irish woolen manufacture. On the continent of Europe, after Colbert's example, the process was much simplified. The primitive industrial capital here came in part directly out of the state treasury. Why, cries Mirbeau, why go so far as to seek the cause of the manufacturing glory of Saxony before the war? One hundred and eighty million of debts contracted by the sovereigns. Footnote. Mirabeau, page 101. End note. Colonial system, public debts, heavy taxes, protection, commercial wars, etc. These children of the true manufacturing period increased gigantically during the infancy of modern industry. The birth of the latter is heralded by a great slaughter of the innocents. Like the Royal Navy, the factories were recruited by means of the press gang. Blasé, as Sir F. M. Eden is, to the horrors of the expropriation of the agricultural population from the soil, from the last third of the fifteenth century to his own time, with all the self-satisfaction with which he rejoices in this process, essential for establishing capitalistic agriculture and the due proportion between arable and pasture land, he does not show, however, the same economic insight in respect to the necessity of child-stealing and child-slavery for the transformation of manufacturing exploitation into factory exploitation, and the establishment of the true relation between capital and labor power. He says, It may perhaps be worthy the attention of the public to consider whether any manufacture which, in order to be carried on successfully, requires that cottages and workhouses should be ransacked for poor children, that they should be employed by turns during the greater part of the night, and robbed of that rest which, though indispensable to all, is most required by the young, and that numbers of both sexes, of different ages and dispositions, should be collected together in such a manner that the contagion of example cannot but lead to profligacy and debauchery, will add to the sum of individual or national felicity? Eden, First C, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 1, page 421, End Note. In the counties of Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, and more particular in Lancashire, says Fielding, the newly invented machinery was used in large factories built on the sides of streams, capable of turning the water-wheel. Thousands of hands were suddenly required in these places, remote from towns, and Lancashire, in particular, being till then comparatively thinly populated and barren, a population was all that she now wanted. The small and nimble fingers of little children being by far the most in request, the custom instantly sprang up of procuring apprentices from the different parish workhouses of London, Birmingham, and elsewhere. Many, many thousands of these little, hapless creatures were sent down into the north, being from the age of seven to the age of thirteen or fourteen years old. The custom was for the master to clothe his apprentices and to feed and lodge them in an apprentice-house near the factory. Overseers were appointed to see to the works, whose interest it was to work the children to the utmost, because their pay was in proportion to the quantity of work that they could exact. Cruelty was, of course, the consequence. In many of the manufacturing districts, but particularly, I am afraid, in the guilty county to which I belong, Lancashire, cruelties, the most heart-rending, were practised upon the unoffending and friendless creatures, who were thus consigned to the charge of master manufacturers. They were harassed to the brink of death, by excess of labour, were flogged, fettered, and tortured in the most exquisite refinement of cruelty. They were in many cases starved to the bone while flogged to their work, and even in some instances were driven to commit suicide. The beautiful and romantic valleys of Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, and Lancashire, secluded from the public eye, became the dismal solitudes of torture and of many a murder. The profits of manufacturers were enormous, but this only whetted the appetite that it should have satisfied and therefore the manufacturers had recourse to an expedient that seemed to secure them those profits without any possibility of limit. They began the practice of what is termed night-working, that is, having tired one set of hands by working them throughout the day, they had another set ready to go on working throughout the night. The day set getting into the beds that the night set had just quitted, the night set getting into the beds that the day set quitted in the morning. 
It is a common tradition in Lancashire that the beds never get cold. With the development of capitalist production during the manufacturing period, the public opinion of Europe had lost the last remnant of shame and conscience. The nations bragged cynically of every infamy that served them as a means to capitalist accumulation. Read, for example, the naive annals of commerce of the worthy A. Anderson. Here it is trumpeted forth as a triumph of English statecraft that at the Peace of Utrecht, England extorted from the Spaniards, by the Asiento Treaty, the privilege of being allowed to ply the Negro trade, until then only carried on between Africa and the English West Indies, between Africa and Spanish America as well. England thereby acquired the right of supplying Spanish America until 1743 with 4,800 Negroes yearly. This threw at the same time an official cloak over British smuggling. Liverpool waxed fat on the slave trade. This was its method of primitive accumulation. And, even to the present day, Liverpool respectably is the pinder of the slave trade which, compare the work of Aiken, 1795, already quoted, has coincided with that spirit of bold adventure which has characterized the trade of Liverpool, and rapidly carried it to its present state of prosperity, has occasioned vast employment for shipping and sailors, and greatly augmented the demand for the manufactures of the country. Page 339. Liverpool employed in the slave trade, in 1730, fifteen ships. In 1751, fifty-three. In 1760, seventy-four. In 1770, ninety-six. And in 1772, one hundred and thirty-two. Footnote. In 1790, there were in the English West Indies ten slaves for one free man in the French fourteen for one, in the Dutch twenty-three for one. Henry Braham, An Inquiry into the Colonial Policy of the European Powers. Edinburgh, 1803, Volume 2, page 74. End note. Whilst the cotton industry introduced child slavery in England, it gave in the United States a stimulus to the transformation of the earlier, more or less patriarchal slavery, into a system of commercial exploitation. In fact, the veiled slavery of the wage-workers in Europe needed, for its pedestal, slavery pure and simple in the New World. Tanti molis erat, to establish the eternal laws of nature, of the capitalist mode of production, to complete the process of separation between laborers and conditions of labor, to transform at one pole the social means of production and subsistence into capital, at the opposite pole the mass of the population into wage-laborers, into free laboring poor, that artificial product of modern society. If money, according to Augier, comes into the world with a congenital blood stain on one cheek, capital comes dripping from head to foot, from every poor, with blood and dirt. Footnote. The phrase laboring poor is found in English legislation from the moment when the class of wage laborers becomes noticeable. This term is used in opposition, on the one hand, to the idle poor, beggars, etc., on the other to those laborers, who pigeons not yet plucked are still possessors of their own means of labor. From the statute book it passed into political economy, and was handed down by Culpepper, J. Child, etc., to Adam Smith and Eden. After this one can judge of the good faith of the execrable political cant-monger, Edmund Burke, when he called the expression laboring poor execrable political cant. This sycophant, who, in the pay of the English oligarchy, played the romantic laudator temporis acti against the French Revolution, just as, in the pay of the North American colonies at the beginning of the American Troubles, he had played the liberal against the English oligarchy, was an out-and-out -out vulgar bourgeois. The laws of commerce and the laws of nature, and therefore the laws of God, Edmund Burke, pages 31 and 32. No wonder that, true to the laws of God and nature, he always sold himself in the best market. A very good portrait of this Edmund Burke, during his liberal time, is to be found in the writings of the Reverend Mr. Tucker. Tucker was a parson and a Tory, but for the rest an honorable man and a competent political economist. In face of the infamous cowardice of character that reigns to-day, and believes most devoutly in the laws of commerce, it is our bounden duty again and again to brand the Burks, who only differ from their successors in one thing, talent. End note. Footnote. Marie Angier, du Crédit Public, Paris, 1842. End note. Footnote. 
Capital is said by a quarterly review to fly turbulence and strife, and to be timid, which is very true, but this is very incompletely stating the question. Capital eschews no profit, or very small profit, just as nature was formerly said to abhor a vacuum. With an adequate profit, capital is very bold. A certain ten per cent will ensure its employment anywhere. Twenty per cent certainly will produce eagerness. Fifty per cent positive audacity. One hundred per cent will make it ready to trample on all human laws. Three hundred per cent, and there is not a crime at which it will scruple, nor a risk it will not run, even to the chance of its owner being hanged. If turbulence and strife will bring a profit, it will freely encourage both. Smuggling and the slave trade have amply proved all that is here stated. T. J. Dunning, First C, pages thirty-five and thirty-six. End note. End of part eight, chapter thirty-one.